Well, good to uh, see all of you and to be with you today. Um, today, I have uh, the privilege of being able to preach to all of you about, about marriage. And anytime that marriage is being talked about at church, uh, one of the tendencies is for those in this room um, who aren't married to think that this is going to be, you know, a half hour that doesn't apply to you, or it might be a time that you can kind of catch up on the emails on your smartphone. And I want to, before we start, give you two big reasons why I believe that is exactly something that you don't want to do. The first thing, or the first reason is this. Um, if you're single, there is a very good chance, not in all cases absolute chance, but there's a very good chance that you won't always be single, especially uh, if, you're, if you're younger, right? And so one of the best ways to be able to have a healthy marriage someday is to better understand what a healthy marriage looks like before you get there. And, and, and that is what we're going to kind of talk about and do today. The other thing is, no matter who you are or what your age is or what your relationship status is, the core of the message today and the core of the verses that we're going to look at today will have an impact on you. In fact, this section of scripture is, is never one that I've preached on when it comes to a marriage a sermon. I've never taught on these verses in regards to marriage. This is a very unique message, at least from um, my past, and I think it is one that will have an impact. The core of it will, no matter your age or relationship status. So, with that kind of introduction, I will confess to you that one of the greatest blessings in my life is my marriage to Carrie. And it's something that um, I feel really fortunate about. I'm glad that it only took a year for me to get her attention and that she, you know, said yes to my engagement proposal and marriage proposal. Um, and I would not trade it for the world. At the very same time, if you were to ask her, and I can be the spokesman for both of us, as happy as our marriage is and as wonderful as it is, let, we'll be really honest that it, it hasn't been easy. That marriage is not easy. That marriage takes a whole lot of work. That living together with someone all the time takes a lot of work. And the truth of the matter is that getting together is a whole lot easier than staying together. In fact, uh, one author wrote that uh, all you need to get together is a heartbeat and some eyes. That's all it takes. But it's staying together that takes a lot of the work and a lot of the focus. Now, it's interesting that we as a society seem to magnify the pursuit the getting together part. In fact, I was reading an article in prep for this message this week, and the author commented that when you think about romantic comedies or romantic Disney movies, what are those movies all about? They're about the courtship. They're about getting the girl's attention, aren't they? And then when does the movie end? With the wedding, right? And then the words that proclaim that they lived happily ever after. In fact, the same author wrote this. She wrote, no one wants to see Cinderella in sweatpants with 10 week old roots in her hair, sitting over a pile of bills, laundry in the corner, dishes in the sink, husband down in the basement, sobbing because somewhere along the way, the reality of what she thought things would be like clashed with what life actually is. Yeah, I don't know if Disney's going to be making that movie anytime soon. But at the same time, that's real life. That and things like that is what real married life is. The courtship, that is awesome. It's not real life. The honeymoon, great. That's not real life. Real life is the... 20, 30, 50 years, however many years God gives to us together and the, the daily grind, so to speak, of marriage. It's, 
Getting together is easier than staying together, and statistics bear that out, don't they? Um, there's a statistic that's been in America for, I think, at least three decades from what I saw, that 50% of marriages will end in divorce. Another statistic that's rather new, like within two years, that when Americans were surveyed, six out of 10, or 60% of people in marriages would classify or say that their marriages are unhappy marriages. And there's a lot of reasons why people break up, and there's a lot of reasons why people get divorced, and there's a lot of reasons why people feel stuck in their marriage. And we're not going to be able to unpack all those reasons and address them all. But instead, for this one message in this series about marriage, what I wanted to do was to get to what I believe is the biggest factor and the biggest reason. And it has to do with focus. Our first fill-in for today is this. When your focus wavers, so will your relationship. When your focus wavers, so will your relationship. Now, I have a, I have a feeling that many of you think you know where I'm going with this. Ben, you're going to tell me that I need to spend more time in my schedule focusing on my wife. We need to go on monthly date you know, nights, and we need to turn off electronics in the evening so that, guys, we can talk, and we need to find a hobby to do together, right? And all of those things, I highly recommend. All of those things are really, really good, but that's not where we're going. And that is not even the relationship that we're going to be talking about today. In fact, in a very weird way, the key to your marriage might be thinking less about your marriage. What do I mean by that? Well, do any of you remember the movie from the 90s called Jerry Maguire? Yeah, it, you just dated yourself if you made a noise or tapped the uh, person next to you. I have found, working with the staff and volunteers that we have, that I am now declared old because I'm not a millennial or whatever. So, <laughs> Well, in this movie, Millennials, okay, in the mid-90s, um, at the end of it, Tom Cruise, I'm going to use their real names because, well, I guess Tom Cruise is Jerry Maguire, but Tom Cruise... Um, he declares his love for Renee Zellweger, and in that de declaration of love, he uses this three-word statement that so many guys in their dating relationships rip off, and it's, it's now just cheesy. You, you know those three words? I love you. <laughs> yes, that's good, but they're up on the screen. That's good. You haven't seen Jerry Maguire, Matt. You complete me. You complete me. Use it. No, but actually don't. Because what he meant by that phrase is that he could not live his life whole without Renee Zellweger. What he meant was that his life would be less than complete if he didn't have her with him. And that sounds awesome, and that sounds great. The idea that this person you're going to live with is going to perfectly complete you, and you're going to go from half of a person to a whole person because you're married. It sounds awesome, but it absolutely is wrong. There is no person that can complete you. Being married to someone who happens to be a sinful human being just like you cannot make you whole. And so when we try to find our completeness, our wholeness in Renee Zellweger or whoever it is that we're married to, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment and we're setting up our spouses for failure because they can't give to you that which Tom Cruise thought Renee would give to him. So, where should the focus be? Well, for that, we're going to turn to a sermon that Jesus preached. Um, it's sometimes 
known or most often known as his Sermon on the Mount, and that's just because he uh, preached it from the side of a hill near the Sea of Galilee. We're going to dig right into the middle of this sermon with a section in which Jesus is talking about worry. Let's start with verse 25. Jesus is speaking. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Don't worry about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? What, what Jesus is doing here is he's making a comparison. So if God is the one who gave you your body, why would you worry about clothes? If he gave you the big thing, your body, would he even give you the, the little thing, clothes? And if God's the one that gave you your life, why are you worried about food? If God gave you the big thing, which is your life, will he not also give you the littler things to sustain your life, like food. Verse 26. See, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Here Jesus is saying, if birds don't have to worry about what they eat, but they have food and God takes care of them, you, who are much greater than birds, don't you think, wouldn't it make sense that you also will have the food that you need. And in fact, can any of you, by worrying, help anything? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Again, spinning, millennials, means making clothes, okay? All right. Yet, I tell you that not even Solomon, an Old Testament king who um, had everything you could think of in the world, in all of his splendor, was dressed like one of these flowers. Next verse. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, not very valuable, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And we get to verse 30. 31. So don't worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? And I want to give you the flavor of how these questions are being asked by make a comparison. Have you ever had to organize or get ready for a big party? Like, let's say a graduation party. Some of you I know are thinking about that right now. And I just want you to imagine that it's getting to crunch time, and there's a very little time left, and there's a whole lot to do. And I want you to think about how you feel in that moment. Especially, I think, moms, right? And you tend to ask yourself all these questions that tend to be rhetorical questions, like, how am I going to get all this stuff done? And where are those decorations that I need to put up? And why is no one helping me? It always seems like everything falls on me, you know, and the family never helps, oh, right? And there's all these questions. Where is everybody, right? And, and you get into this, this mode, this, this, this feeling where you just panicked. And I get it in that situation in some ways because in that moment with just a little bit of time left, it's all up to you. Your focus is on you and what you need to get done. I want you to think of that as you read these words. So don't worry saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? And what are we going to wear? The focus here. Well, where is the focus? Let's look at verse 32. See, the pagans talk like that. The people who don't have God run after all those things and, and talk like that. And they're all stressed out and worried, not about the party, but about life and about what they have or don't have and what they need. Because it's all up to them. And it's all up to the people around them. And it's all up to their spouse. And then Jesus, in a magnificent way, totally changes the dialogue and totally changes the focus off of ourselves devoid of God, to the rest of verse 32. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. It's not up to you. The focus doesn't need to be just on you or the people around you to give you what you need. Your heavenly Father knows. 
He's with you. The, the one who feeds the birds, backtrack a little bit, is the one who's going to feed you and take care of you. And in fact, notice how Jesus calls God in this verse. He uses the title Father. I love that title. Because if it wasn't for that, I think our natural inclination to think of God as that guy up in heaven sitting on a throne with a royal scepter who is holy, but may be too busy and powerful for a little person like me. But Jesus reminds us of who God is. He is rightly called Father. And what does a good father do? He takes care of his children. What does a good father do? He's concerned with what his children need. What does a good father do? He loves his children. And that is who we have in our lives. A father who loves you deeply and counts it as his personal responsibility to take care of you and give you what you need. So here's what often causes disappointment and frustration in marriage. We forget the second part of verse 32, and we act each day more according to the first one, the first part of verse 32. And it's interesting when, when you look at these verses, um, it's, it's just amazing how blessed we are in 21st century America. Like the things that people were worrying about then, what were they? Like, am I going to have a meal? And am I going to have clothes to wear? Like, when's the last time you wondered if you're going to eat today? or that you have a place to live in a cold Minnesota winter night. Like, very rarely, if any of us have ever been there. That's how blessed we are. But there are other desires that we have. Other desires that when you were thinking about being married someday, as a teenage girl, or a teenage boy, or a 20-something, that, that you had this, this picture of what it would look like, and, and how it would go, and what you would have. And it's okay to dream. That's okay. But then you look at your own life and you look at it and you're like, you know what? I would have never picked to live in this neighborhood. I would have never chosen to have the financial restraints that we have. If I could pick the car that I wrote about in my diary as a teenage girl, it was not this one. And the thing is, is that so often... Our spouse, whether husband or wife, is probably doing everything they can to give the family together, or if only one works, to the family, the things that you need. It's not that they're lazy. It's not that they're working, you know, not working hard. It just is what it is. And you see, we get upset with our spouse about a picturesque, marriage that we don't have, but it's really not a marriage problem. It's a God problem. It's really not an issue with our spouse most of the time. It's a contentment issue that we have with God. And these types of things run even deeper, and maybe this next part will apply even more uh, to many of you. Um, you know, oftentimes, in marriage, we have the desire to feel things, to feel happy, to feel significant, to feel pretty, to feel important, to feel loved, right? All these feelings that we have. And, and then we can get, you know, upset in our marriages as, as a person looks at their spouse and says things like, you know, and I, I've heard most of these, he doesn't make me feel happy. And she doesn't make me feel important. And he doesn't make me feel pretty. And she doesn't make me feel desired. And I'm not saying that a husband or a wife does not have any responsibility in these areas. Don't mistake what I'm saying. There is a part of when a husband or a wife is doing things the way God designed, that it will allow our spouse to feel good things, right? But I, all I'm saying is, if you are looking to the person you're married to, to make you feel the way you want to feel, 
you're setting yourself up to be disappointed. Because you're married to a person that cannot do that perfectly. Cannot give you everything you want. Cannot make you feel everything you want to feel. And when we try to squeeze that from them, the things that we want, the things that we feel like we, we need to feel, it's like taking a two-ton boulder and having them hold it. They are going to get crushed under the weight of that boulder, and it will be impossible for them to ever live up to your expectations. These things that we talked about, they're things, guys, whether single or married, that, that have roots in our relationship with God and a foundation in Christ and what he's done for us. Tom Cruise was wrong. It's not your spouse's job to complete you. This is good news for single people. You don't need to wait to get married to feel whole. You can be whole and full already. You are complete, not because you're married. You can be complete, well, how? Look at what Pastor Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2. Because in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. In Christ, you and I are complete. God intended marriage to be a huge blessing, guys. And it takes work and it takes sacrifice. The type of love that God requires of us to give to our wives or to give to our husbands is a bar that only God himself has ever reached perfectly. This selfless, self-giving, not concerned about my needs, but always about him or her. The, the desire to always go second, so to speak, is a good picture of it. There's some amazing roles that God has given to us, but he has never given us the role to complete our spouse. They need to come to completion. We need to come to completion and feel complete in Christ. That's our next fill-in. You are complete in Christ. If you're looking for some other human being to complete you, you need to give God his job back. Do you know when things change the most for you? It wasn't uh, the day that you entered a relationship with your spouse. The day the things changed the most for you is the day that the Holy Spirit enabled you to enter a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's a, a huge difference in our entire lives and what makes us happy and, and, and where we find our peace from, in, despite whatever circumstances we're in, when we recognize that life is greater than just the years we have on this earth. That death is not the end, but that life is eternal. And when we begin to view our lives and our marriages through the lens of eternity, which only was given to us by Jesus, things begin to change. When we remember that when Jesus died and rose again, we have the gift of eternal life in heaven by faith in him, things begin to change. We begin to realize that what I'm looking for, what I had been looking for is happiness, but what I really need is joy. And real joy does not come from a car or a house or a spouse or whatever it might be. We begin to realize that real peace doesn't come from an amount of money that we might have put away in the bank account or from things being peaceful at home. Real peace comes from the fact that I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. We begin to have real contentment. We begin to realize what the difference is maybe between needs and wants and what we really need and what maybe are just desires. You see, when our focus is on Jesus Christ and the completion that he's given to us, things, things begin to change. The best spouse can never give you what Jesus has given you, but the worst spouse can never take it away. 
The best spouse cannot give to you what Jesus has given to you. The worst spouse does not have the power to take it away. And so if all of this is true, that true completion comes through Jesus Christ, then what does that mean for our marriages and our lives? Well, there's one more verse. Verse 33 says this. So, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things that you're looking for, that you think are so important, they'll be given to you as well. When I was in college, um, I had a friend who really loved Tabasco sauce. And when I say really loved Tabasco sauce, like he took it with him every, almost everywhere. He found some sort of travel size Tabasco and he would have one in his car or in his pocket and go to the cafeteria and in college he'd take out the Tabasco sauce and we'd go out for pizza with the guys. He'd have the Tabasco sauce in his coat and put it on the pizza. He'd go on a date with someone and take her to a fancy restaurant in New Ulm like Perkins and <laughs> hey, don't laugh. That was fancy. He'd take out the Tabasco sauce, and he took it everywhere. And when the time was right, he would take out the Tabasco sauce and pour it on whatever it is he was eating. Okay, stay with me here. I think we're really tempted in marriage, and even in Christian marriages, to treat God like my friend used his Tabasco sauce. I mean, we like him, God, that is, right? And so we end up going after whatever it is in front of us, our careers, our kids, our retirements, whatever it may be. With all the gusto and with all the focus that we can have. And then, and this might be a little overstatement for some, but then the tendency may be that we take out God at the appropriate times and we just kind of add him to whatever it is that we're going for. So Sunday morning, you know, like, you know, we're getting out the Tabasco sauce and kind of putting a little God in, in our lives. Or maybe it's a big test. Some of you just had them. I bet your prayer life increased in the week leading up to the test because you know what you're doing? You like God. You took him out. A little dab here and there. A big interview. Take out God. Add him to our life. Kids come. You get out the Costco size. Lots of God. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> oh, yeah. You get to crossroad in your marriage and you call up the pastor or you go to a counselor and it's time to get out the God and kind of add him to the marriage. And what I'll say is that in all of those circumstances, they are, they are perfect circumstances to rely on God and to seek him in those moments. I am not telling you not to do that. But what I am saying is that what I just described is not this verse. What I just described is a marriage seeking other things and adding God into it. What this describes is a marriage that's seeking God first and other things will fit where they may. Now, there is no way that I can unpack all of that and what that looks like in your marriage. And in some ways, I don't really need to because you guys are big people and you know, you know when you're a little bit off. You know when you're not seeking God first, right? So it takes some thinking. What does it look like? But I thought it would be helpful if I shared at least two very practical ways in case you're not sure where to begin, that I believe will be a huge help in seeking God first in your marriage. The first was mentioned at marriage night a couple weeks ago. I'm going to mention it again. It's our next fill-in. To pray together daily. Now, I will confess that Carrie and I did not always do this. 
it's not that we never prayed together, but, you know, it's like before meals and it's the come Lord Jesus, right? Which is good. It's, it's, an adi- it's a good prayer, you know? It's before bedtime with the kids and maybe together as a family. But it, it wasn't until maybe five, seven years ago where now we'll very rarely miss a morning where we don't pray together and most of the time even hold hands as we pray. And it's not that hard. It's not, no pressure to pray. It's asking God for his guidance and things and some specific issues that we're facing. It's confessing. It's asking for forgiveness from the Lord. It's just thanking God for the things that he's done. It's all of those things. And I will, I will tell you, it's really, really hard to be ticked off at your spouse when you're holding their hand in prayer. And sometimes, you know, some mornings it's taken all that Carrie has to want to pray with me, right? No, no. But it helps and it works. And it's not like some good luck charm. It is a couple seeking God first in the morning. Here's, here's a stat that will blow you away. Among Christian marriages, so just the Christian segment, guess how many pray together daily? Less than 8%. Of that 8%, less than 1% get divorced. Again, not a good luck charm, but I think it's indicative that daily prayer, that daily discipline of something that's much bigger going on in that family, and in that couple. The second thing is this, that I would encourage you to pursue God together. Pursue God together. What do I mean by that? I know that this is something that we don't see in Minnesota very often, but when teams win championships, they tend to, at the end, I lament that because I am now a Minnesotan, and I wish I'd see more of it. They tend to, in case you haven't seen it before, they tend to run onto the field and run onto the court, and they're all jumping and hugging and tears of joy and happiness and smiles, and and it's like it's one big happy family. How does that happen? How did that happen? I'll tell you what didn't happen. It's not that, you know, they all got together with their teen counselor and worked out all their differences necessarily. And that has its place. But what I'm trying to illustrate is the togetherness that happens when two people are going together towards the same thing. What if instead of pursuing retirement together or instead of pursuing, you know, whatever your hobby is together, what if you also, and maybe even more importantly, pursued God together? What if you looked at each other, talked about each other, looked at your gifts and thought, hmm, How can we together use our life to make an impact that's much greater than this life? And some of you have already been doing that. Many of us have never talked about it. But what will happen when we pursue God together, when we both have the same goal, which is a closer relationship with the Lord and seeking first his kingdom, what happens is we grow together. Pray together, pursue God together. Where's your focus? It's a good question. Whether you're single or married, the best recipe for failure in finding wholeness is to put that in the hands of a sinful human being. The good news is we don't need to entrust our wholeness and our joy and our peace to a human being. God has what you need and he wants to give you what you need. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this truth, which is that the greatest part of us is what you have done for us. Our greatest source of peace and joy is what Jesus Christ, your son, has done for us. And Lord, we have to admit that oftentimes we can tend to blame the people closest to us for things that may not even be their fault. I can't control the person I'm married to. 
but we can control our thoughts and our focus. And may today we be reminded that a lot of the problems we have are ones that are solved by you. Ask you to bless each marriage represented in this room and ask that you would just guide us to seek you first. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.